Welcome to the Think Christian Podcast, where we just have one thing on our Christmas wish list, a review from you on Apple Podcasts. Just a star rating and a couple of comments would really help us out. Thanks so much. Josh Larson, TC Editor here, and it is indeed Advent, a time of waiting, a time of presence, a time for the familiar characters of the Christmas story including the Magi who brought gifts to a child they called the King of the Jews. Now, that phrasing in Matthew 2 is one of the first New Testament indications of Christ, not only as King of the Jews, but as King of Kings, as he is described in the book of Revelation. We're going to consider how a Christological understanding of royalty sits along two recent pop culture monarchies in England That's in The Crown from Netflix, of course, and then in Wakanda from Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. I'm eager to jump into this one, so let's get to it, starting with Claude Acho and the Black Panther sequel. I've been on pins and needles because even though Black Panther, Wakanda Forever has been out a few weeks now, I think, I have no idea what Claude Acho thinks about it. As of earlier this week, Claude, nothing was logged on Letterboxd. No tweets whatsoever I could find. So I know you have thoughts. Give <laughs> this it to is me. funny. Oh man, this is funny. Um, yeah, I've been pretty sw- silent in the in the Twitter streets of late in in general. I was pretty disappointed with the movie, to be honest. I didn't have high hopes, just recognizing what a difficult task that Ryan Coogler and 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 everybody uh, a part of that team, the task that they had in front of them to to try to push the story forward, honor um, the death of Chadwick Boseman. And honestly, like I haven't, I haven't been tapped in with Marvel stuff for for several years. Just I, I maybe tapped out of MCU for a bit. I didn't have high hopes, although I will say the trailer was phenomenal. That sort of lifted my spirits a little bit, but um, didn't quite work for me in the way that I would have hoped. But um, I, I recognize as a as a tall order to fulfill. Yeah, I think that's what the challenge was attempted, and I don't know if it was met either, and I'd agree with you, it was a difficult challenge given the demand, the demands that the MCU puts on these filmmakers, even a filmmaker as yeah. talented as, as Kugler. And so I was very torn over this one and ended up really being in a place where I wouldn't say I'm tapped out on the MCU like, like it sounds like you are, but this pushed, <laughs> this surprisingly pushed me in that direction, and I would mm-hmm. not have expected that because the first Black Panther was one where it was like, okay, we can still get stuff done within this monstrous, mm-hmm. you know, MCU universe. We can still do some interesting things here. And I think Wakanda Forever tries to do that in terms of wrestling with Bozeman's death. And I think those are maybe the best parts for me. I really liked right away how even with the Marvel logo, which usually is a lot of the different superheroes, it was all T'Challa. It was all Chadwick Bozeman as oh. T'Challa thought, what a nice touch, um, you know, to kind of like recognize that someone has been lost. And then I think they made a lot of space for it in the film itself, gave it a lot of time. But man, was that all in competition with a lot of MCU nonsense, squeezing in extraneous characters, all the stuff that, you know, a lot of people have complained about from the beginning, really, of connecting these stories into a larger narrative. And it just felt extra awkward for me here. And then the other thing, Claude, I got to say is... um, Except for a few of those morning scenes, which were clearly all live action on a, you know, a nice production designed set or on location. Those looked good, but otherwise a lot of the action here was so muddy. CGI was just ugly, which was a shame because Mm. for the most part, the first Black Panther was such a gorgeous production. And I felt that was lacking a little bit here Mm. too. Yeah. I think that's all fair. Yeah, there there are probably three scenes that really moved me, or three moments maybe. There's one in the beginning, one to, toward the toward the very end, and, and I think some somewhere in the middle. It felt like just a lot to juggle, sort of like the the theme of grief and mourning. But then there's sort of the MCU humor, and then there's like oh, it was just a lot, you know. And I, and I think um, more is not always better. So that was a bit of a challenge for me. I, I think I would. It did increase my appreciation for the first one, you mm. know. So, and I don't, I don't know if that's what it was setting out to do, but that was sort of a takeaway for me that I just it made me remember how special it was to to watch that first film, and actually made me excited to watch it again at some point uh, soon. Yeah, yeah, I think we knew that when it came out, but you're right to see that that was sort of a minor miracle that Coogler pulled off to make 
an idiosyncratic picture as much as it was, especially when you see how maybe it didn't quite work as well this time. I do think there's still some interesting stuff going on here that that we do want to dig into. And one of those things is this idea, it's consideration of royalty. Uh, I had a chance to see this, went to the press screening with um, Wheaton College prof, Michael McCoy, who ended up writing about Wakanda Forever for the TC website. And so afterwards, we were just kind of tossing some ideas back and forth about what TC stuff was in there. And um, there was a lot. And one of the things that we kind of circled around was this idea of royalty and how it was this continuing thread. And I think you can see that in the 2018 film as well. You know, what we got there was a conflicted portrait of what it means to be the monarch of Wakanda. Maybe the nation itself in that movie is presented as something of a utopia, but the burden of of wearing the crown was in the first film as well, a thematic thread for Chadwick Boseman's T'Challa. So Claude, I would love to hear what you thought about this consideration of royalty as it was presented in Wakanda Forever this time around. Maybe maybe especially with Angela Bassett's Queen Ramonda, T'Challa's mother. She has a prominent part in relation to this idea of royalty. And then so does Letitia Wright's Princess Shuri, T'Challa's sister. So just focusing in kind of on that idea, how do you think this film handled its consideration of royalty? I do think that royalty theme with both Queen Ramonda and uh, Shuri is really interesting. And it's also interesting because like the first film, it's more pronounced here, but it's not just a question of royalty in isolation, but royalty among the nations. And it's sort of how does royalty function not just in, in, in isolation, but really in relation to other, you know, monarchies and, you know, governments and, and, and sort of um, uh, civilizations and nation states and, and so forth. And I think what is interesting here is just the pressures and the stresses of leading and of leadership on that sort of level that is not just leadership, but is, is sort of this um, elevated place of reverence. And I think it's fascinating that it just magnifies the pressures and further demonstrates whatever character is inside of a particular leader. And so I, I think it's fascinating to see sort of what happens when vengeance is front and center in the heart of royalty and how that reverberates into communities and into people. And then what happens when maybe there's a shift away from, from vengeance and, and how does that reverberate among the people, but then among the nations, right? So I think of the the early scene in the in the film with Queen Ramonda in among the United Nations, right? And sort of her her posture, her, her sort of uh, regality that in her presence and her character and the way that has an impact, right? This sort of, the, the, it's kind of this moment of righteousness and actually like diffusing movement of violence and, and vengeance, right? But then that, that becomes more complicated as the film goes on. Let our gracious response to this incursion be an olive branch. Further attempts on our resources will be considered an act of aggression and met with a much steeper response. I thought that was one of the really interesting points of the movie. And I think that's also related to the sort of other nations, right, that are placed into the story and the way that royalty is embodied in different spheres. So so I did think that was a that was a really fascinating aspect of of the storyline. So the monarch almost as model who is followed by the people that they are, you know, representing, and then also then either pushed back against by the other nations, that model is either adopted or pushed back against. Yeah, that's definitely a thread going on there. I think you see it. We haven't even got into this. We talked about how much is in this movie, but there's a whole new nation of people we meet yes. led by a monarch, essentially, right? Namor, played by Tena Cuerta. And this is a Mesoamerican people who live underwater, have been essentially like Wakanda laying low for quite some time, but have now chosen, um, because of provocations, to rise up. And I think in, as you were saying, Queen Ramonda offers one way of modeling justice or nonviolence, and we see Namor choosing another tact. Right. And and Namor's people following him and then how that has reverberations in the real world. So, yeah, it's interesting just to think about um, Namor in that context as well. Now, if we think about royalty and give it a little bit of a theological spin, I want to throw a paradigm at you and see if this makes sense and, and is kind of helpful in thinking about Wakanda forever. But what if we think about royalty in a bit of an Old Testament, New Testament paradigm? So in the Old Testament, we see Flawed human rulers really struggling to live up to divine ideals. Even some who who manage to be good leaders of Israel, there are 
struggles within that same person, or certainly throughout the nation's history, the king's struggle. And then we have the New Testament where we see Christ, the sacrificial lamb, who is also king of kings. And I'm wondering if either of those understandings of royalty were reflected for you, Claude, in Wakanda forever, in any of the figures there or any of the sequences or just in the the general narrative it takes us through. My mind is drawn to, you know, especially thinking sort of in, in kind of the Old Testament framework, obviously Saul and David are, you know, two two primary examples. And I think, you know, sort of Saul is the sort of the, the vengeance, the paranoia, the unrighteousness, right? He wants to hunt and kill David. But then you also think about David, serious flaws and all, but still scripture speaks of him as sort of a paradigmatic king of Israel, right? And I think specifically of, of you know, First and Second Samuel, and you think about the moments where David has been hunted by Saul, and David has the opportunity to quickly after kill Saul, but doesn't. Right? He cuts and takes a corner of his robe to demonstrate that he he wouldn't dare put his hands on uh, on the Lord's anointed, uh, and that the Lord will lift him up at the right time. First Samuel uh, twenty four. So I think those demonstrate the sort of contrast, right? The sort of vindictiveness, the paranoia, the fear, and then David, the sort of willingness to uh, say, "I'm going to." not lay hands on the king out of reverence for for God and for the king. And justice will be done for me by God, but not by my own sword. And I think that's actually something that the movie really does pick up on, rather. And without, you know, spoiling things, I think this is the challenge for, for Shuri, especially, on how will she cope with this deep sense of grief. I think there's a line in the in the film where she wants to see the world burn, right? What's the world? The world is not just creation, as, as valued as that is. It's the nations, right? It's other kingdoms, right? And, and the beauty and the glory and the diversity that they embody. And so uh, rather, she, she's pulled between wanting to see those things burn and wanting to, I think, what I would describe as kind of this David impulse to say, you know, justice has to be dealt with and, and, and brought about in a different sort of framework. Yeah, you're right. We won't spoil anything, but there's an exact scene that came popped in my as soon as you started describing that passage yeah. with David yeah. Saul, there's an there's a scene that is very much a parallel. So so I like that a lot. And then also, this is definitely a spoiler. So I'll be very vague because it doesn't appear until the the mid credit scene. But I I think there is, I think Wakanda Forever offers a touch of a coming king that somewhat mirrors the Christmas story. We could yeah. say so. Yeah, so there are there are little reflections of this idea throughout the film. Maybe we won't talk about them in any more detail than that, though, to to keep yeah, it fresh. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other aspect too is you mentioned sort of the like if we thought in the sort of two tracks that obviously we know the Bible is one one unified story, but there are movements in the story and there are developments. It's it's like a um, it's like an artist, right, who's sort of like unveiling. A, a piece of their painting, you know, movement by movement. And and mm. it's only at the end that you can see everything that has come before in a new light. So I think the sort of Old Testament, New Testament dynamic on royalty is is helpful. And I, and I think about one of the things with the New Testament's language around royalty is even this language of the royal royal priesthood that uh, Peter uses in 1 Peter 2. And the, so, so that royalty is not simply one person, but it's 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 all of God's people are brought into this. And that's where I think that monarch as model idea becomes really becomes really important. But also related to that in Revelation towards the last two chapters, there's this picture of new heavens and new earth where the kings and the nations will bring their glory into the kingdom of Jesus. And I think that's the other interesting aspect of the film is with Namor's people, this new uh, this new nation that we're, we're introduced to, there's a lot of glory. There's a lot of beauty there. It's, it's pointed in the wrong direction. But I think the film has a couple interesting moments where th- is there an opportunity for these nations to actually come together in, in a way that is uh, harmonious and good and true and beautiful. And I think that's another interesting thread that it feels like the movie can't can't quite pick up on, but I think it has a lot of resonances to 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 the Christian gospel and the hope that we long for. You're right. It can't quite pick up on it. I think one example, and this isn't giving anything away because you know essentially that Namor's people are going to go into battle against uh, the people of Wakanda at some point. And so we get this huge battle scene. And to your point about the beauty of both nations, to me, it struck, it was deeply sad to see these peoples essentially killing each other when they are both born in a way of the same experience of being excluded or colonized or trying to fend off mm-hmm. colonization. And these are these are two nations who 
should be in lockstep in many ways. And we're watching them kill each other. And at the same time, I'm recognizing that that is deeply sad to watch. And the movie somewhat recognizes it on some level. That whole sequence is also trying to insert like thrills and the Marvel action and other yeah. characters and make it exciting. And I think that that speaks to what you were saying about it not quite getting there is it can't it can't be both things at once. It can't be this sequence of lament, which you see it wants to be in some way. And then also this like thrilling battle action mm-hmm. sequence, which is a different set of emotions. And it's just another example, I think, of where there's a lot of tension in this film that never resolves. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I, I wonder, um, and, and again, hopefully people have, have seen this or, or seeing it soon, but I, I wonder how much there are things that are gestured towards, right? There are there are moments of sort of like, oh, maybe some of these things will will come down the line in later stories. But, you know, I, I think this would have been a really interesting place to explore some of that, to maybe take some of those things that are hinted at and, and maybe start the story there and, and sort of develop these interesting threads. We haven't seen a lot of movies where two nations that have been oppressed and colonized in ways are side by side or, or kind of running through those um, those histories together. That, that mm-hmm. would have been interesting. And, and I think, it again, it, it really does remind me of a lot of the language in the Psalms about the nations, you know, coming together in a, in a way of righteousness under the king's rule. There's threads there that are interesting, but yeah, I, I would have loved to see those fleshed out well, I'm sorry that we couldn't talk about a movie we both loved a lot more, but I still I still think there was some good stuff here to dig into. So thanks for doing that with me, Claude. Um, anything else on the film you wanted to touch on? I mean, this thing runs almost, is this, was this almost three hours? I feel it's like it was almost close. three hours, yeah. So we it's probably left hours. out a lot. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to make sure to mention or you think we covered it. I think we got it. I do... Um... I'm glad that the movie's out, and uh, there there's some really poignant moments. But it, it was a it was a it was a tall order, and it, it it didn't quite hit it. But there there are some worthwhile, interesting things here. Yep, that's fair. All right, we're going to talk to you again sooner rather than later, Claude, because uh, we were just talking before we started recording about the best of 2022 shows we have planned that are coming up. We're going to do a couple of them, and it sounds like uh, you're going to be part of the music one. So I'm looking forward to that. I've got your pick on hand. I won't spoil it now, but I'm going to uh, immerse myself in that music the next week or two until we talk again. And uh, that'll be a good conversation too, I'm sure. So I'll see you uh, in a couple of weeks. Thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. Can't wait. Hello, your in-house DJ, John J. Thompson here. And if you were listening to this anywhere but YouTube, you would have just heard a little bit of Rihanna's downright hymn-like new song, Lift Me Up, from the Black Panther Wakanda Forever soundtrack. Sure, I suppose superhero movies may be slightly predisposed to fits of messianic grandeur, but this hunger for a king thing is just about universal in our species, isn't it? Some of us want to find a king or a queen to serve, some want to be royalty, don't we? We may know in our heads that monarchs and dictators don't work out too well, but that doesn't stop most of us from, at some point, kind of wanting one. I wonder why that is. And as I take a look at the popular music of the last 50 years, I see that I'm certainly not alone. From today's political scene to the ancient Israelites, kings and queens have been a central figure of the human experience, and songwriters have been exploring these ideas for a long, long time. As usual, I have scoured the digital shelves at Spotify and pulled together a special and wildly diverse playlist of songs that explore these ideas. Kings, queens, princes, princesses, royalty in general are all on the dance floor this time. You'll even find tracks from a band called Queen, one called King's X with a song called King, and a killer deep track from Prince about Pharaoh. How meta can you get? You know how to find the mix by now, right? Yes, I thought so. And if you have an idea for a royalty-themed song I should add, tweet at me, at John J. Thompson, before the new king of Twitter burns that app to the ground. I jest, of course. That's what jesters do. Until next time, this is JJT encouraging you to crank this mix as you think about royalty and our species' lingering hunger for kings and queens. I think we would have learned our lessons by now, wouldn't you? Peace. I'm happy to welcome a new voice to the podcast, Rosalyn Hernandez. Rosalyn, you're new to the show, but not to Think Christian. Way back in 2015, when you were a student at Fuller Theological Seminary, you contributed to our Theology of Star Wars ebook. Somehow you snagged The Empire Strikes Back for your essay, the best movie in the series. Right. <laughs> it has been a bit. So tell us what you've been up to since then and what sort of work you're doing now. Yeah, so I am still at Fuller. I am I have graduated since then, but I am working with the Fuller Youth Institute at the moment, and I 
do research. I create resources for youth ministry. And I'm actually the podcast producer at the FYI on youth ministry, which is the FYI podcast. And yeah, I'm also transitioning into a position of diversity, equity, and inclusion at the Fuller Youth Institute. So that's something that's going to be on my plate I'm, and I'm going to be working on in the new year. Very cool. Are you still going to be doing the podcast then? Or yeah, yeah, I will. Okay. Okay. So this is a, <laughs> a, a taking on more situation a little bit, yes. right? Yeah. Sounds good. Well, it is great to have you on the show, and you will actually be back on the TC website very soon as well with a post covering another corner of the Star Wars galaxy, the streaming series Andor. So looking forward to that too. For now, though, we are going to talk about something a little more down to earth, though though hardly common. We're going to talk about season five of The Crown. This is the Netflix series that has been following Queen Elizabeth II across the decades, Season five finds her in the 1990s. So we have a whole new cast to consider for this season. We have, as Elizabeth, Imelda Staunton. Folks will recognize her probably as Dolores Umbridge in the Harry Potter films, if her face looks familiar. Dominic West is on hand playing Prince Charles, and Elizabeth Debicki is playing Princess Diana. So tell me, Rosalyn, have you followed The Crown since the beginning, and what do you think of this latest season? Yeah, so I have followed The Crown since the beginning. I've watched all the seasons. What I really like doing is the fact-checking. <laughs> um, yes. Of like Googling, okay, wait, how did this actually happen? Like, who is this person? Um, you know, looking at, you know, um, like newspaper clippings and the documents and all of that stuff. So I find history really fascinating. And so that's one of my favorite parts of watching it. And then just like the drama of the series is so interesting. Unfortunately for me, I think Queen Elizabeth's character is very controlled and somewhat subdued in in the Mm -hmm. series, but everyone around her is, like, so dramatic. It's true. (laughs) So they're, like, the really juicy characters that I think keep me coming back to to the series Um, because I think, you know— at the end of the day, some some of what the draw is for this, for a lot of people, is the controversy of the incidents that have happened along the years of of her reign and, you know, with just everyone that's been around the royal family. So, yeah, I think the juicy of the drama really keeps me coming back. And you get a lot of that in season five, but you also mm-hmm. get do you think this is the most reserved portrait of the queen at this point with Imelda Staunton, that sort of stoic nature you're talking about? It's It seems, when you describe it that way, the contrast is even greater in this season because she seems to be getting quieter, more reserved, walling herself in the palace, and yet there's more, as you said, drama and scandal going on outside. Is, has that kind of been your experience with this season? Yeah, yeah, definitely. She's and she's and it's something that is so explicit, right? Because she's very aware of her position and mm-hmm. so aware of like the responsibility that that it is, and so as she gets older, as she kind of like has to control more things. And so she's like, uh, like I can't let my feelings. And that's also like a very British thing, right? Like they don't let emotions show that much. Um, And then she's getting older. So she, you know, takes more time to talk, takes more time to figure out what she wants to say. Just like a lot of, how do you say it? Um, a lot of deliberate. Mm-hmm. It's very. She's very deliberate in her actions and in her speech. For um, sure. And so, as she gets older, that's something that kind of like she's a sl- slower to react because she's like trying to figure out what is the right way to react to, to this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. It's so funny you talk about the fact checking because so I watch this with my wife and she is I'm more the person who wants to like focus in as it's happening and then afterwards, you know, maybe track something down, but she's it sounds like she's more like you. She's got, you know, the phone out or whatever and is yeah. double checking all this. Now wait a minute. What? So, that's probably a common experience and I think we've been both hooked from the beginning in somewhat of a love-hate way, at least for me. I should just say for myself, it's a little bit of a love-hate thing because in general royalty, and I think British royalty in particular, just seems 
it's so maddeningly fascinating to me. It's just crazy that this still exists today, <laughs> right? Or in or yeah. in recent history. And I do think the series has me caught because it continually toys with those conflicting emotions. There are times where it critiques the mm-hmm. monarchy in some episodes, but then there are others where it remains completely dazzled by it. And I think even single episodes will go back and forth a little bit, and I can't escape that. I'm kind of caught <laughs> in that experience. Love hate might be too strong, but it's it's something along those lines. Yeah, I, yeah, I definitely feel the same way. I do think too though this series has been consistently interesting theologically um because it's been exploring Elizabeth and her husband's personal faith quite often throughout the seasons. So that's one way, but also mm-hmm. this idea of the monarchy as being divinely appointed and mm-hmm. In episode four, I believe it is, of this season, there's an interesting moment. The queen mom, so this is Elizabeth's mother, played by Marcia Warren, tries to encourage Elizabeth to stiffen her lip in the face of difficulties. And she does this by doubling down on the idea of divine appointment. Monarchy is the only part of the Constitution with an element of the divine. When you wear the crown, you are transfigured. So there's a lot to dig into with this idea of a theology of royalty, even in just this season, Rosalind. I'm wondering what has stood out to you along these lines. Yeah, I mean, it's so funny that that you bring that clip into it because for me, it's not so much a theology of royalty as it is a theology of empire. Um, Mm. And like historically, you know, it's just the context of the United Kingdom, right, is it's been an empire. It's been about colonization, which is actually, well, I believe, antithetical to the kingdom of God. So the royalty of empire is about like subjecting, you know, and ruling the other. So for her, it's like, oh, like put yourself together. You have to rule other people, but the royalty of the kingdom of God is about being for the other. So I like instantly th- like things that come to my mind are like the royal priesthood of all believers and like Romans A, like the royalty of all who are adopted into God's family, like we're all co-heirs with Christ, right? Mm. And so like, even like as a contemplative and like a modern mystic, like that idea that one person through a role, through the crown is connected to the divine is something that doesn't sit well with me. (laughs) Um, Because, you know, like the divine is in the mundane. The divine is, Mm -hmm. as we would say in Spanish, in lo cotidiano, in the quotidian, and like the mundane things of everyday life. For me, you know, like Richard Rohr talks about this in The Universal Christ. He talks about how I think he thinks of himself as a panentheist, like that Christ, that the divinity is in everything and transcends everything. And so... Yeah, we don't need to be transfigured. We're already in communion with the divine in our full in the fullness of our humanity. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, like Justo Gonzalez brings that up in Mañana. You know, he talks about how the only way we have seen the divine is through the humanity of Jesus. Like that's how that's how the divine has showed up for us. That's how we have seen it. It has been incarnate. It has been human. And that you know, like Jesus didn't come to show us what like divine out there is, but like how we are divine when we are, when we become fully human and we recognize that. So yeah, like the royalty, the, my theology of royalty is Uh when I look at Jesus, very subversive, like very radical, very countercultural. Yeah. So it's like Jesus being for others, you know, Jesus coming from like a lowly place, like what good can come from Nazareth, you know, like it's not about privilege. It's about being someone who who is for others, who looks at the margins and brings and centers the margins. So when I think about that, about it that way, like, no. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Queen Mother. <laughs> but no. <laughs> thanks well, for you, no thanks. <laughs> you took it from transfiguration to incarnation, and I love that. And you're also talking about being for others, I came across uh, an article that is interesting along those lines by the Episcopal priest Fleming Rutledge. This was back in 1999. It was a series of Advent articles she wrote actually for the Christian century, including one called Royalty Stoops. 
And she discussed the unique appeal of Princess Diana she was talking about here. Yeah. Uh, this is what Rutledge wrote. In the Princess of Wales, majesty stooped. That was the key to her power. She was seen as one who was willing to lay aside her princely prerogatives to come alongside those who are downtrodden. So that's a little bit more along the lines of what you were just talking about. Now, we do see some of this in season five. There are sequences, you know, where Diana is visiting patients in the hospital. But I think it's maybe more interesting to talk about away from the individual in the larger context as you were and consider how, you know, all of the royals and the institution of the monarchy really can it stoop or does it only force others to stoop? I mean, even, even as representatives of the Church of England in the show who are supposedly divinely appointed, you know, that's what they claim. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if we see any real evidence of this, I guess you could call it spiritual stooping, or it sounds to me you see it more as a system designed to protect privilege, really. Yeah, yeah. I think as a system, I do see it that way. And one of the quotes or the scenes that stood out to me that is one of those critiques, as you mentioned earlier, about the monarchy is when John Majors is talking to his wife after a party. And he says, like, the senior royals seem dangerously deluded and out of touch. Mm. And the junior royals are feckless, entitled, and lost. And this is after, like, the queen is like, hey, give me some money so I can fix my yacht. That's right. (laughs) Some public money. This is the prime minister. She's demanding. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. That is that is a pretty glaring example there. There's also a moment in the second episode where Diana's father-in-law, so Prince Philip, so the, the queen's husband, played by Jonathan Price, he's chastising her for causing waves yeah. and turning the public against the royal family. For better or for worse, we're all stuck in it. And we can't just air our grievances and throw bombs in the air as in a normal family. Or we end up damaging something much bigger and something much more important. The system. When he talks about protecting the system in this clip, it definitely seems to me he's talking about their privileges more than any higher sense of holiness. You know, those those qualities of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God you were talking about, justice peace, kindness, mercy. That's not what necessarily seems to be, you know, what he's talking about, what he wants to preserve or protect. It's more that system. So Mm -hmm. even if you fold Diana's charity into that, it is hard for me to watch this and believe that, you know, there there is divine appointment at work here. Even if some of the people within it might be genuine people of faith. And I do think that's one of the interesting tensions, as I said earlier, you know, there was an episode in an earlier season that was all about Philip's personal faith. And that is, and it can be somewhat of a separate thing to consider than this theology of royalty that we've kind of been considering. So is there anything else you wanted to touch on about the show, Rosalind, or do you think we, we've covered season five pretty well? Yeah, well, I, I would like to say Diana is the, the obvious, like, you know, where everyone's mind probably goes to when we think of royalty that is stooping that is incarnate or or like with the people she was called the people's princess right and the people loved her and she loved the people Um, but a really interesting um moment is in episode five i believe and at the very end and it is so short and i am so sad that it's this short but charles goes to a high school and he's telling the kids you know the disadvantaged kids like i know there's greatness in you and other people have overlooked it And I'm going to focus on you, the kids on the margins, and I'm going to do stuff for you. And being for you, I'm going to do justice for you. Now, you may think that someone of my age and background wouldn't understand young people in your communities and the unfair judgment of society that you sometimes face. Well, as it happens, I do understand a little bit about what it is to be criticized and judged. And I also know that those judgments are mostly not true. And then my favorite part about that is that while he's giving the speech, they cut to like different things that he did in that visit. And um, he's like, you know, like just talking to the kids, just like being in the moment, being with them, like being amazed by the things that they do. But the favorite thing is that he break dances with them. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And in that scene, 
there's like no diegetic sound. You don't hear the kids. You don't hear like him saying no. It just goes into this um, soundtrack of don't sweat the technique or don't something like that. And so it's like, you know, like he's letting go. He's surrendering this idea of that who he is, Mm -hmm. is like someone that doesn't do this. And he's accepting that hospitality and he's entering into it and and returning it back to these kids. He's being teachable and humble because that is like, he knows he's looking foolish, but he's still doing this and he's doing it like wholeheartedly. Like you can see the joy in his face as he's with these kids just being in the moment, yeah. forgetting about any title. Um, so that's something that um, really stuck out to me. So it's not at all like, as a system, yes, it's not there, but the people themselves, like Philip also, like his friendship with Penny, that was such, like, that was so full mm. of kindness. Like he was so for her. He like suffered with her. He noticed her pain. He extends hospitality. He extends like the um, opportunity for community with, Carriage writing, which, you know, again, dangerously diluted and out of touch, but it's kind. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. kind. You know, it's it's their thing. And there's some mutuality in that relationship. Uh, he's holding space for her. He's supporting her. And it's something that he has to defend. So he gives, he gives her hospitality in that friendship. And he accepts that hospitality himself because it's a friendship that he really needs. And it's something that he doesn't let go when the queen and him talk about it. He's like, I need this. Yeah, And then true. the queen's like, okay, well, now we have to make it seem like we're all friends and we're all okay mm-hmm. with this. So let's invite her to church and to other things so that people don't talk. So there's like so many great, beautiful things. And then it's like, okay, well, we have to uphold this system and we have to perform certain things to protect these these like beautiful parts of where we're actually like living into royalty. Yeah, or, or the through system. my theological royalty understanding. Yeah. <laughs> the system almost dehumanizes them from embracing those moments. That Mm -hmm. scene you mentioned with Charles and the students, it is somewhat his Diana moment. You know, that's a a scene we would expect to see her in. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it worked for you as a genuine expression, not any sort of strategizing or trying to burnish his image. Because throughout, he and Diana are having somewhat of a public relations war, a back and forth. But for you, that sequence worked as, as a genuine expression, it sounds like. Yeah, and you know, it seemed genuine also because the way he starts the speech is like, a lot of people don't see my greatness. <laughs> yeah, he's 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 awkward all around, which is accurate in the performance. I've seen a lot of complaining about how handsome Dominic West is and how they, they just don't know if that is accurate. Um, and I, I can see that, but I think in moments there in that scene, he's able to tap into the awkwardness that we also associate with the actual Prince Charles. Yeah. And, and it's like, there's this genuine, authentic, like caring for the other that's mixed in with like, I care about myself and I feel misunderstood. So I understand how you're misunderstood. Mm. It's like, there's the, both of those things that are like, oh, wow, really good, like goodness. And like, oh, some selfishness, but yeah. it comes out genuine because yeah, that's the way it is. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's a, it's a layered performance, definitely. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I definitely hope to have you back at some point. Until that happens, folks can read your and or post over at thinkchristian.net. And for anyone wanting more Crown coverage, we have posts on the website for each of the previous seasons, as well as one in the works for season five. We, we do love ourselves some crown here at TC. <laughs> Thanks again, Rosalind. This was fun. Have a wonderful Christmas, okay? Thanks, you too. TC contributor Kate Myrick has written about the crown for us a couple of times, including a new post on season five. I was emailing her about that, and she asked a pertinent question. Is monarchy really ordained by God? It was Israel that wanted a human king, and God warned them it would bring oppression and disaster. Good point there, Kate. That reality, the fallibility of human monarchies, is just another reason we needed the King of Kings, who came via manger, not thrown at Christmas. Thanks to Rosalind Hernandez for joining me along with Claude Acho on this episode. 
You can also hear Rustlin on the Fuller Youth Institute's Youth Ministry Podcast, and you can read Claude by picking up his very good book, Reading Black Books. That makes for a great Christmas present. Again, if you're looking for a gift to give us, we'd love to have you leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Every review does help us out, reach new listeners, and it just takes 30 seconds or so. A star rating, a couple of lines of comments would be great, and it's pretty easy to leave a review even as you're listening right now in the Apple Podcasts app. Scroll down until you get to reviews, and then you can leave yours there. Thank you very much. Did you know that you can also find the TC Podcast on YouTube in a video version? We have other video content there as well. To see all that, just search for Think Christian on YouTube. If you are watching us on YouTube right now, well, that means that you missed out on a couple of tracks from the Spotify playlist that John J. Thompson compiled for this episode, all under the theme of royalty. So if you want to hear those, search for the Think Christian playlist on Spotify. You'll get not only the two songs he selected for this episode, but a whole bunch others will be there. The TC Podcast is a listener-supported program of Reframe Ministries, a family of programs designed to help you see God's story reflected throughout your whole life. Visit reframeministries.org for more information. Our audio engineer and post-production supervisor is John Reeder, and Reframe's co-director overseeing content strategy is Robin Basselin. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back early in the new year when we're going to have a couple of best of 2022 shows for you. Should be a lot of fun. We'll talk to you then.